Uh, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to everybody um, who are following this series of webinars uh, of the ICDT Foundation called The Story Behind. My name is Joel Traboy and I am the Senior Vice President of ICDT and I will be your host today. The topic today is COVID-19, of course, what else, and its implications on the world economy. Let me to introduce you uh, our two distinguished guests. Professor George Churányi, who is professor at the Corvinus University in Budapest, former president of the Hungarian National Bank. Actually, twice he was the president of the Hungarian National Bank and who had a key role in uh, between 1995 and 2001 uh, in re-establishing the Hungarian economy's equilibrium and also fighting the galloping inflation. And our other guest is Professor Adrian Kendry, former NATO senior defense economist and strategic advisor of the 12th NATO Secretary General. Now, for those who don't know, the 12th NATO Secretary General was Anders Fogh Rasmussen. And he is also visiting professor at several universities, among others, at the NMITE in Hereford. First, I would like to uh, ask Professor Shurani. The COVID pandemic has a devastating effect on world economy, causing the probably worst crisis since the Great Depression the economic crisis of the 1930s. But its effects seem to be different and more long lasting. Many people are talking about a crisis of the globalization. What you feel, how you feel, what you think, will globalization seriously affected and how it will be stopped, reversed or modified? What is your opinion about it? Um, good afternoon for everyone. Thanks very much for the invitation, for the opportunity provided to me this afternoon. Uh, let me uh, make a, a brief clarification of the, of the crisis. Uh, back to uh, 2020, uh, we were celebrating the longest uh, growth period of the American economy ever uh, registered. So it was obvious for many analysts uh, that there would be an end of this long uh, up, upside uh, of the cycle. And uh, whatever, for whatever reason, there will be an end of this uh, uh, longer than 10 year period. Uh, in light of that, I would say that the, the uh, pandemic was uh, which, which was an exogenous factor, which uh, initiated uh, this uh, crisis, uh, was uh, on the one hand uh, unexpected, on the other hand, uh, most of the players really did expect something to happen. Uh, as far as the depths of the crisis is concerned, uh, I have a little bit different assessment uh, back to 2020, uh, the first, the second quarter of 2020 seemed to be uh, simple disastrous. The contraction was clearly unprecedented. It's been even uh, deeper than the Great Depression, not even to mention the, the uh, uh, Great Recession back to 2008, 2009. Uh, nevertheless, uh, once we were uh, leaving behind the second quarter of 2020, uh, the, uh, thanks to the response, uh, global response uh, to the crisis, the, uh, the depths, uh, the recovery uh, happened relatively and surprisingly fast. Uh, by the end of uh, 2020, the global economy contracted roughly 3.5% which was uh, by far the, the deepest uh, recession registered over the course of the uh, past few decades. Uh, but if we look forward, we have to see that the, uh, 
uh, expected position of the advanced economies uh, by 2022 is going to be only 3% below uh, what was projected uh, at the beginning of 2020. So the recovery is surprisingly fast, uh, in spite of the fact that the pandemic uh, created dramatic uh, losses, primarily human losses. Uh, the picture is not uh, as uh, uh, encouraging if we take into account the position of the uh, low-income countries. Uh, the contraction uh, is uh, deeper in, in their cases, and the recovery is far uh, slower than in case of the advanced economies. As far as the globalization is concerned, initially everybody was uh, frightened because of the expected uh, impact over many areas, uh, such as the global uh, uh, production chains, uh, were, uh, were hurted. Uh, we could see, uh, if we analyze the, the crisis, we could, uh, we could see that it's been simultaneously a demand and supply side shock, which has created this uh, unprecedented contraction uh, in the second, second quarter of the year. Uh, nonetheless, uh, after that, the recovery uh, was fast. Uh, partly uh, the fear that the uh, that the global that the globalization will end uh, abruptly uh, or it's going to create uh, a tremendous uh, losses uh, within the global cooperation has fortunately has not happened uh, it seems to me as if the globalization is about to survive uh, although uh, the globalization is going to be changed. The speed of the globalization is going to be much slower. And there will be a few areas where uh, the, the uh, globalization, the supply chains uh, are going to suffer permanently. But hopefully it's not going to uh, stop uh, the globalization, which has created uh, really uh, substantial uh, substantial uh, gains. On the other hand, we also have to be aware of the fact that the globalization uh, has downside as well. So we shouldn't uh, applaud one-sidedly. On balance, uh, I believe that the globalization uh, offered uh, much more progress uh, to, the, uh, to the people, to the uh, different uh, people. Now, uh, if we uh, move forward and if we are uh, um, analyzing the uh, response, uh, global response uh, to the crisis, uh, I would uh, briefly return to the uh, Great Depression. Uh, fortunately enough, the policymakers and the academicians as well uh, drew the right conclusions uh, from the serious mistakes uh, committed during the Great Depression. In case of the Great Depression, when the stock market collapsed, uh, banks uh, went uh, bust, people uh, lost a tremendous amount of wealth, uh, unemployment shooted up to the sky. The global, the macro response was the worst possible. Uh, the fiscal policies were about to balance uh, on the one hand, and the monetary policy created a serious uh, liquidity squeeze, put serious liquidity squeeze in the system. As a consequence of that, uh, the, uh, the collapse of the, of the stock exchange, collapse of the banking system, uh, shooting uh, unemployment, lack of demand, was further exaggerated by the uh, irrational response of the fiscal and monetary policy. Uh, already, uh, back to the financial, the financial recession, the, the Great Recession of 2008-2009, the policy response were uh, definitely uh, deeply different, and the lack of demand was uh, primarily in the Anglo-Saxon world, uh, 
uh, offset it with the concerted fiscal and monetary stimulus. In case of Europe, the uh, response was, uh, uh, how to say, was a bit uh, controversial. Uh, for one or two years, there were some fiscal, uh, fiscal uh, support and some uh, loosening of the fiscal stance, but far too soon, the fiscal policy returned to restriction. Uh, as far as the monetary policy is concerned, there were, there were also a serious delay in applying uh, non-conventional measures in a wide extent. So therefore, the recovery in the US was uh, uncomparable faster uh, and, uh, and uh, more successful uh, as compared to Europe. Uh, in case of the, uh, the US, especially the, the Federal Reserve has opted for a wide range of unconventional means. However, I have to say that the uh, so-called unconventional policy, uh, uh, policy and the unconventional instruments more or less could have been predecessors in the previous uh, uh, decades. Uh, but but it's important that uh, primarily the, the, through the quantitative easing, the Federal Reserve could have created a uh, low uh, yield curve all over the lengths of the, of the yield curve. Uh, low interest rates, negative real interest rates. Uh, and even if the fiscal deficit shoot it up, uh, the growing supply of uh, government securities have not increased any upward pressure on the yield curve. On the contrary, the yield curve have, the, the Fed has uh, managed to keep the yield curve down. Uh, so the, the American response was, uh, was uh, put the, the, it was a sequenced response. The American policymakers uh, were targeting the uh, balance sheet imbalances, uh, not simultaneously. First, they targeted the banking system balance sheet and the households balance sheet and the, the corporate sector balance sheet and uh, intentionally uh, in order to offset the contractive uh, impact of the balance sheet uh, adjustment of the banks, of the households, of the, uh, of the corporate sector, uh, intentionally they have uh, increased the fiscal uh, expansion. The fiscal deficit of the, uh, of the US jumped from 4% uh, of the GDP to over 10% of the GDP for three consecutive years. Retrospectively, it is said that the fiscal uh, stabilization uh, has been started a bit too soon. It could, there could have been an even more generous fiscal stimulus uh, provided, then uh, the recovery would have been much uh, uh, stronger, even in case of the US. So the Americans uh, created a prior, prioritized uh, the, the balance sheet adjustments and intentionally they, uh, they focused on, on the household, on the banks, on the, uh, on the corporate sector. And on the other hand, they have uh, increased the fiscal expansion combined with a very lax monetary policy. This combination of the policy mix uh, provided a fast recovery more three quarters uh, after the deepest point of the recession, the American economy has recovered and continued to grow. In case of Europe, unfortunately, all the uh, balance sheet imbalances were simultaneously targeted. Uh, and as a consequence of that, the uh, recovery uh, has been uh, the recovery was postponed quite substantially, and the European economy reached its peak, its uh, pre-crisis level only uh, by 2015. So, at least three years later, as compared to the to the US. Uh, in this, uh, in the current crisis. Uh, the policy ma uh, policymakers uh, drew the consequences and the lessons of the Great Recession, and uh, they have uh, 
bravely opted for uh, a wide range of uh, policy measures. Again, there is a striking difference between the continental European and the American response. Again, the American response was uncomparable, braver, uh, more generous, if you, mind, if, uh, if you don't mind, uh, as compared to the European. However, uh, I have to say that uh, uh, much too many observers surprise, the European response was much, much faster much, much broader and much braver uh, as one could have foreseen, it, foreseen and uh, as could have been forecasted. Uh, now the, the, the American, uh, the fiscal uh, response in the US uh, put together both the Trump and the Biden administ administration for trillion uh, dollar uh, stimulus. Uh, which is uh, actually much higher as compared to the European one. Um, the, uh, again, as a consequence of that, the American recovery is much faster. It's visible the first quarter uh, growth of the American economy turned out to be 6.6% uh, on an annualized basis, whereas the European uh, performance is uh, minus 0.6% on annualized basis. So the distance is uh, still big. Uh, to me, the uh, most important difference uh, between the two beyond the quantitative uh, distances, namely that the uh, American fiscal response uh, was uh, much deeper and, uh, and uh, bigger, uh, that the, the whereas uh, Europe, mostly concentrated on the so-called Kurzarbeit. So concentrated on preserving the jobs, uh, the American response was uh, deeply different from that. The American response was uh, uh, let the, the uh, economy uh, move ahead uh, and uh, let the economy use the creative dis destruction so the, uh, those who, have, uh, uh, who were uh, employed in, uh, in sectors of the, of the, in those sectors of the economy, which were uh, seriously hit uh, by, the, by the pandemic, uh, they simply closed, they simply uh, massively uh, laid off uh, their employees. On the other hand, at the same time, uh, rightly so, the American fiscal policy provided a significant uh, uh, fiscal layout uh, to the layoffs, to the unemployed. So the, uh, beyond the unemployment benefit, the, uh, those who lost their jobs uh, received substantial fiscal uh, support. Actually, to my taste, it's been a bit uh, too generous since uh, more than 60% of the unemployed uh, enjoyed a higher real uh, revenue, higher, higher real income uh, as compared to their uh, full-time job uh, position. Uh, nonetheless, uh, by providing uh, a kind of a helicopter uh, type money uh, to many, uh, the American economy uh, managed to keep up the domestic demand, managed to offset the otherwise seriously contracting, uh, contracting uh, consumption-related demands. And uh, it has also facilitated uh, much more successfully uh, the creation of uh, new jobs, new job opportunities. Uh, the, Again, uh, I'd like to underline here that meanwhile, uh, during the course of this crisis, the central bank, the Federal Reserve and, and the European Central Bank as well uh, have opted for uh, quantitative easing. For the first time, primarily in the US, uh, the policymakers opted for uh, a wide, uh, wide usage of helicopter money. Uh, 
I would say that from monetary policy point of view, from a theory point of view, uh, frankly, I do not see much difference between the uh, quantitative easing and, the, and dropping the helicopter money, because at the end of the day, uh, in both cases, the central bank balance sheet is about to grow. The central bank uh, uh, holdings of, uh, of uh, government securities uh, are increasing. So the, the, uh, the treasury bills and bonds are ending up in the balance sheet of the central bank. And on the other side of the central bank, on the li liability side, uh, the fiat money, the, the central bank money uh, is about to, to increase. What makes uh, a real difference between the two uh, that uh, meanwhile the, the transmission mechanism of the quantitative easing is uh, moving, working through uh, the asset price uh, increase. Therefore, it has a very significant uh, unwanted negative side, side effect namely the income and wealth uh, differentiation is about to increase. Uh, in case of the uh, helicopter money, distribution of helicopter money, this negative impact is less uh, present. Uh, in fact, the money is moving to the, uh, to the pocket of the individuals. Therefore, they are uh, mostly used that money for current purposes, for current consumption, rather than uh, increasing uh, the asset prices, rather than creating asset price bubble. It is not uh, as crystal clear as I try to say, because uh, we can have uh, clear evidence that even this uh, helicopter money might end up at the asset uh, market and might create some uh, increase, uh, might create some bubble, but it is uh, far lower as compared to the simple uh, uh, quantitative easing. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, on, on the other side of the Atlantic, in Europe, uh, both the fiscal and the monetary stimulus was a bit weaker, however, much stronger than it was uh, a decade ago. Uh, here, uh, the, the helicopter money has not yet been, uh, in fact, uh, implemented. Uh, so on per capita basis, uh, as in case of the US, the first 2000 and the, and the second, uh, 600, uh, second uh, uh, 1400 plus 600 uh, was not distributed. However, in case in the, within the framework of the new generation EU, the issue of uh, 750 billion uh, uh, euro uh, can be taken at, at least that part of that issue, which is going to be a grant, can be taken as a part of a, a quasi helicopter money. Uh, as far as the, the quantitative easing is concerned, it is. Uh, it, it turned out to be far more flexible, far more uh, broader than uh, 10 years ago. Uh, here, uh, no one has questioned the, uh, the legal uh, rights of the European Central Bank to fulfill the role of a lender of last resort. And uh, the European Central Bank is, uh, uh, is uh, buying uh, uh, really significant, substantial amount of government securities, primarily on the secondary market. Uh, this secondary market transaction is uh, a bit hypocritic because the quantitative easing is, uh, by definition, to my mind, is a monetization of public debt. Uh, and uh, as long as this monetization uh, is not creating excessive demand, has not undermining price stability, has not undermining uh, external stability, has not undermining uh, the inflation uh, expectation. If the inflation expectation is uh, anchored around price stability, even more if the inflation expect inflationary expectations are uh, negative in the sense that uh, deflation is, is uh, 
forecasted, then uh, the monetization of the public debt uh, can be taken as a as a right uh, policy of the center of the central banks. So all in all, I would say that the uh, that the current crisis uh, seem, I mean, primarily uh, this is devastating because of its uh, health-related aspect, because of the serious uh, human losses uh, uh, all over the world. And unfortunately, we are not at the end of the road, even if the vaccination has been uh, accelerated uh, primarily and unfortunately only in the advanced economies. Uh, the uh, economic uh, impact uh, is going to be <clears throat> less uh, dramatic, especially in case of the advanced economies, due to the fact that the policymakers have, have drawn the lessons of the previous serious crisis. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, dear Professor. Uh, that was extremely interesting and very comprehensive description of what's going on and what has uh, gone on. I would have uh, one more question. What do you think about the structure of the world economy? Is it changing? And if, if it changes, how? So because now we can see a lot of uh, talks about uh, China raising uh, even faster than before. Uh, will the US keep its leading role in the world economy or will China take it over? And what, what is your assessment about Europe? Uh, does Europe have a chance for um, keeping the third place in the world economy? Uh... Well, uh, being European, ob obviously my answer is yes, uh, but uh, let me formulate it uh, more seriously. Uh, the, uh, indeed, the Chinese response uh, was uh, the fastest and perhaps the most efficient. Uh, nonetheless, uh, I believe that the, the American economy, uh, fast recovery, is more than encouraging. I'm a bit afraid of, uh, of the stimulus packages. If we put together all those packages, it might turn out to be a bit too strong. So I do share the anxiety of many uh, policymakers from Larry Summers to uh, Martin Wolf, from, uh, uh, from uh, Rogoff to uh, Olivier Blanchard, that there might be uh, an upward trend in the inflation, there might be a faster than uh, desired uh, inflation over the course of the uh, coming few years. Uh, by the way, Charles Goodhart also uh, uh, put this issue into, into the center of his analysis. And due to the changing role of China on the one hand, and the demographic changes on the other hand, he expects the inflation to return to much higher uh, arena as we have experienced over the course of the past decade. So uh, I believe that due to the fact that the American economy, the inherent strengths of the American economy, the excellent universities, the uh, high degree of innovation, uh, dramatic number of startups, uh, uh, the uh, research and development activities, uh, the, the uh, legal environment, uh, the rule of law and so forth. So I believe the American economy still keeps its, uh, its leading role. As far as the volumes uh, are concerned, uh, I do share of many analysts' view that the Chinese economy, uh, well, first of all, the Chinese economy, as far as the, the volumes are concerned on purchasing power parity, has already been ahead of the US. So uh, by 2015, 2016, uh, as far as the volumes are concerned, China is above, is, is, uh, is uh, ahead of the, the US. 
nonetheless, uh, the Chinese population is still four times uh, bigger uh, than the US. So the per capita output is still lagging behind. Uh, historically, uh, looking into the perspective, uh, I have uh, relatively little doubt that the Chinese economy will further uh, grow. And even at the current exchange rate, it will take over the lead uh, in five, six, seven years horizon. Nevertheless, as far as the relative strength, the per capita uh, performance is concerned, still the US is enjoying a significant advantage uh, of that. As far as Europe is concerned, there are encouraging signs and there are less encouraging signs. The encouraging signs uh, is that uh, at this stage, uh, within this crisis, uh, the European decision makers were flexible enough to suspend the otherwise completely unsustainable fiscal rules. I mean, the fiscal rules, the Maastricht Treaty, as it is, uh, are not sustainable. They are uh, not neither too strong, neither too loose. They are just practically dramatically controversial. So it's been uh, absolutely timely to suspend those rules. Uh, and it's been very fast uh, when, the, when the European, uh, on the uh, uh, recommendation of the European Commission, the European uh, leadership uh, accepted the suspension of those rules. It's been very encouraging, especially the speed of that uh, reaction. It's been also very encouraging that this uh, next generation EU fund has been established because it's a breakthrough uh, in the history of Europe. Uh, the uh, potential issue of the um, uh, really multilateral uh, bond, the really European bond, is a, a very deep, far-reaching structural uh, reform in case of the euro. What is less uh, encouraging, at least to me, is that uh, the, the volumes are lagging behind. So uh, meanwhile, my, uh, my instinct says as if the Americans were overdoing uh, the response, the Europeans are lagging behind the curve. So much uh, braver, much deeper uh, uh, fiscal and monetary stimulus uh, should have been uh, put in place. And I hope that in light of the uh, lagging performance behind the US, the European leadership will, uh, will uh, think it over. Uh, to my taste, uh, actually, the, the next generation EU should have been at least twice as big as it turned out to be. And uh, if, uh, as a con and uh, all the uh, uh, bonds in that case, uh, that is 1500 billion, should have been taken over directly by the European Central Bank. Uh, in case of Europe, this additional uh, demand generation uh, could have been done and should have been done taking into account that the monetary union, the countries uh, uh, within the monetary union are running constantly two to 3% uh, external surplus, which means that uh, within the monetary union, there is a permanent lack of demand, savings investment balance are positive, which means that uh, Europe is uh, uh, spending uh, much less on uh, consumption and investment uh, as it could have done. Uh, and uh, as long as the inflation is uh, anchored, as long as there is a threat of deflation, uh, as long as there is a eight plus percent unemployment, as long as there is competitive underutilized capacities within Europe, uh, as long as there is a uh, credible policymakers and credible institutions uh, like the European Central Bank, uh, I believe the, the additional uh, demand generation would have been and should have been uh, justified. So by that, uh, I really do hope that uh, Europe can uh, catch up 
Europe can uh, accelerate its growth. Uh, of course, uh, here uh, I didn't mention I didn't mention at all. However, it is absolutely vital. It's not only the uh, the uh, magnitude of the demand which does count, but the quality of that demand is also absolutely important. So it is vital uh, from the point of view of the future European growth, how fast Europe is going to be in digitalization, in the green uh, Europe uh, development, in the climate change uh, uh, area, how fast we can, uh, how, what an extent we can support research and development, innovation, startups. Um, so it is, it's not only a quantitative issue, uh, the necessary quantity is just the, the, the adequate quantity is just the necessary condition, but not the sufficient condition in order to be able to catch up to the uh, faster growing American, not even mentioning Chinese economy. Dear professors, thank you very much uh, for sharing uh, with us um, your, your very uh, interesting view. And especially because you started to widen a little bit the topics towards the end, uh, innovation uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, I believe there will be many different questions, at least already in my head, you raised many, many questions that I would love to ask you. But now we will wait with the questions. First, um, I would like to, um, uh, to pass the floor to Professor uh, Adrian Kentry, who would continue to widen a little bit the, uh, the impact of this uh, crisis in the world economy and the COVID caused crisis because he would talk a little bit about the security implications of the global economic meltdown. Professor Kendry, the floor is yours. Just one moment, we have to activate. You have the floor. Uh, Jolt, thank you very much, and uh, my considerable congratulations and thanks to Professor Shuriani, who has given a really wonderful overview of the evolution of the crisis from the economic perspective, and has offered us also an extremely important comparison and contrast with what happened back in 2008, 2009, and in the period that followed when, as he correctly pointed out, that the policies that were adopted in Europe really gave rise to measures of austerity that created all kinds of political tensions as well as economic tensions and the comparison with the quantitative easing in the United States at that time was considerable. Now, when we come to the, um, the onset of the pandemic in uh, January 2020, in terms of its immediate awareness of the impact, we are looking at uh, the fact that uh, both in Europe and uh, in the United States, uh, measures were taken because they were absolutely fundamental given the, um, the rate at which economic contraction uh, was being projected as people were being required to stay at home, uh, work from home. In the first major lockdown period in the first part of 2020, as I'm sure Professor Shurani would agree, um, the ability for people to and governments to work on having people uh, able to work from home, uh, digital connectivity, um, having the right kind of logistics and supply chain dynamics that enabled people to uh, both consume and also uh, where necessary or essential produce 
physically, um, the whole kind of period was very grim because as uh, Dr. Shirani suggested, you know, people were very frightened about what this might mean uh, for the collapse of uh, the economic order, uh, the liberal capitalist economic order on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, and additionally, what this might mean for uh, the breakout of um, uh, insecurity, uh, the meltdown of societies and so on and so forth. As it turned out, and uh, as um, Dr. Shirani has very well illustrated, a number of uh, leading economists on both sides of the Atlantic pointed out that by the um, second lockdown period, which we can characterize as sort of uh, late spring into the summer, um, many lessons had been learned for advanced economies as to how to proceed with um, maintaining demand, maintaining um, economic output by virtue of using all kinds of digital connectivity. I mean, the fact that we are speaking to each other today in this manner is a tribute to that digital connectivity, which has become almost uh, uh, replacing physical contact with anybody. Um, when you see people physically now, it's a bit of a shock. You don't quite know exactly what are you going to say and how are you going to develop the discussion. But this debate that we're having today, I think, has uh, very well illustrated the importance of the monetary and fiscal policy measures that have been developed on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, and the differences have been very well illustrated by uh, Professor Shuranyi with regard to how the United States has proceeded during the last, uh, well, during the Trump presidency and now notably into the Biden presidency. For Europe, of course, we have all of the, um, all of the measures that have been introduced by um, the European Union through the European Commission. And I think Professor Shirani has made a very, a very strong argument about what has been good about this and what still needs to be done. In the case of the country where I am sitting in uh, digitally, the United Kingdom, the United Kingdom, of course, is a bit of an outlier. Uh, in fact, there are a number of outliers on a global basis. The United Kingdom is an outlier because its decision, uh, wrong decision in my view, to embrace Brexit has led the United Kingdom to have a, a rather strange combination of having successfully been able to vaccinate uh, a significant percentage of the population in the UK, um, to be able to preside over the uh, production and development of a number of the important vaccines, but at the same time to be now handling the consequences of the, um, of the trade agreement with the European Union. And uh, it's still too early to tell exactly how that's going to work out. But my judgment is that there are already significant challenges in terms of cross-border trade. And those challenges give rise to other problems. I mean, political problems, which are linked to the pursuit of populism. I'm sure um, the audience is aware that one of the big concerns at the present time in the United Kingdom is the breakup of the United Kingdom. Scotland looking to maybe have a further referendum to become uh, a breakaway country which would rejoin the European Union. Many uh, people in Scotland are rather supportive of this, although I think the overall balance of the opinion polls still is unclear. But the other big concern is in Ireland, where the country of Ireland divided between the Republic of Ireland in the south and the Northern Ireland in the north is giving rise to very big fears about how the uh, so-called Northern Ireland Protocol is going to be able to accommodate uh, challenges to trade between uh, Northern Ireland and the remainder of the United Kingdom. On this particular point, I would like to take up your invitation, Jolt, to indeed uh, elaborate further on what concerns me uh, regarding the world as a whole. Um, Dr. Shirani has very well illustrated that the um, differences between the advanced and the emerging economies remains a significant 
big concern. And that concern, of course, is because the, um, the further uh, horrifying spread of the coronavirus 19 in Asia, particularly in India, but in other Asian countries, but not China, as far as we can tell, um, gives rise to very big concerns about how this is going to um, hold back the recovery in a number of the large economies. I'm, it's worth um, recalling that uh, we used to discuss the so-called BRICS. The BRICS were, um, back 10 years ago, all the rage because it was thought that Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa would um, shape the destiny of the world in the future. Um, the comments by Dr. Shiranyu with regard to competition and cooperation between China and the United States are very important because the future of this relationship is going to be based upon various areas where agreement will probably be possible, climate change, for example, although not entirely sure, but also areas such as digital competition and the whole question about um, rare earth elements, strategic minerals and chips for advanced computing processing, that will continue to be a big problem. And the whole issue of supply chains uh, involving key elements is going to be remain a very big issue. But if we look at the other members of the BRICS, Russia is struggling with its economic uh, performance and it indeed has had a significant uh, impact from um, the coronavirus deaths and infections. And that struggling is linked in part to the whole question about the sustainability of the Russian economy with regard to its normal strengths of oil and gas uh, hydrocarbons. And as we move into an era where more and more people are looking for um, uh, not just unconventional energy sources, but looking uh, to renewable energy sources, uh, this poses uh, big challenges for President Putin's administration because of the underlying insecurity of the budget. Um, as far as India is concerned, the present picture uh, shows how rapidly things can change. Back in early January, India under President Narendra Modi was saying that the pandemic was basically over and India's very um, substantial uh, abilities in technology and public health um, investment was going to bring the pandemic to an end. Well, we can see already that India demonstrates the problems about vaccine nationalism. The, the COVAX, the, you know, the, the World Health Organization hopes that we could have a sharing uh, arrangements which would lead to advanced countries being able to significantly share vaccines with the uh, emerging or less advanced countries. Well, it still is the case that 70% of all of the vaccines are to be found in the advanced um, countries and advanced economies. Uh, South Africa is another country where there is very big fears of another escalation in the pandemic. And so I think I just bring my comments to a focus here to say that these instabilities are giving rise, in my view, to uh, three major challenges to the positive outlook that was uh, expressed by um, Dr. Shiranri. First of all, the... Um, the problems that are being experienced in all economies is the question of what kind of jobs are going to be um, are going to be available as we move through this pandemic. Uh, I mean, we heard some very positive remarks from uh, Dr. Shirani about the um, about the kind of the support systems uh, um, that have been um, introduced into the United States. He can he raised concerns about whether they have been too much in terms of providing the unemployed with 
too significant a percentage of their normal income. And the second thing is the how long will these so-called furlough programs continue? But young people across the globe are wondering about what kind of jobs are they going to be able to obtain? Will they be able to obtain good jobs? And I remember back when, Jolt, you and I were in uh, NATO headquarters back in the period 2010 and 11, and we would have conversations about the um, the insecurity that would come from the economic problems and that insecurity spills over into extremism and what's interesting about this pandemic which of course could easily be repeated because we may not have completely learned lessons about environment and ecological sustainability but what this pandemic demonstrates is that extremism isn't just a question of extremism in other countries but as the United States has demonstrated and is demonstrated uh, demonstrating extremism comes from populist approaches to economics uh, particularly uh, and to the political um, kind of divisions that we can see uh, arising. I'll stop at this point because I know time is very short, but the China question uh, in terms of China's relationship economically, strategically in its region, both in the South and East China Sea, and then across the whole of the uh, Eurasian con uh, continent is going to be a very significant challenge for the kind of the approach that we're looking for. But you did ask Professor Shirani about Europe um, you know, and the United States with China. And so I too would agree with him that one can have a very generally positive outlook on both the macroeconomics and the microeconomics of Europe and the USA. But there are very big strategic and political challenges and I do not underestimate that we may get further problems from this pandemic that will once again unfortunately plunge us back into uh, economic and um, uh, epidemiological chaos. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, dear Professor Kendry uh, for this <coughs> pardon, very comprehensive interesting uh, contribution. Um, I think there will be many comments and questions. Now we arrive to, uh, <clears throat> to the part of this webinar when uh, our, our uh, participants can make their comments and can put their questions. I would like to ask our guests here in the Zoom room to uh, signal to me in, um, in writing uh, uh, if they want to take the floor. And uh, also, I would like to encourage those who are following us on Facebook Live to um, put their questions or comments in the comment section of Facebook. And my colleague who is following it will uh, write for me and I can interpret those questions also uh, to the speakers. Now, as I see, uh, I have already the first... Um, uh, the first... Uh, uh, participant uh, asking for the floor. This is uh, Mr. Uh, Kalman Mijayi here in the Zoom room. He would like to uh, make his comments. He is actually at this moment working in uh, Moldova. He is high level um, advisor to the Moldavian uh, government. And uh, at the same time, he is professor at the Central European University. Uh, Mr. Mijayi, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Joel. Thank you for the invitation to this uh, very good discussion and uh, 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 also for the opportunity to, uh, to speak. Um, I will go back to uh, George Shurani's, uh, uh, as always, fascinating uh, uh, presentation. I learned quite a lot from it and I would like to reflect on it with uh, with questions. Um, my starting point is what, what uh, Professor Shurani also mentioned, that uh, this uh, crisis is very different from, uh, from the other, uh, from the 2008 uh, Great Recession. In fact, uh, um, the US is not anymore in crisis. It's in a period of fast recovery a bit uh, 
like a post-war recovery could be, a very, very fast uh, recovery. And um, so my first question is, uh, Europe is lagging behind, but isn't it just a question of a few months and a few percentage points? And of course, few percentage points matter, but, uh, but relative to an extremely fast uh, growth, are we not entering a period already of a fast growth in Europe. And then uh, my question is really just basic uh, uh, macroeconomic management type of question. Uh, why do we need now? So I, I do understand, uh, and uh, it was very interesting what uh, uh, Professor Shurani said about the, uh, the different structure of, of uh, monetary easing uh, in uh, and, and fiscal support in, in the US and, and Europe. Uh, but, uh, but I really have a fundamental question whether we at all now need further uh, support. Uh, with uh, our common uh, friend, um, uh, also very, very strong macroeconomist like, like you, uh, Mr. Shurani, I talked about it and uh, he had uh, Two arguments in this uh, direction, but I have to convince, uh, have to confess that I am I'm not yet convinced. One is that if there is no support, the the economy doesn't go back to this Yanoshi type of uh, trend line, but it 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 goes back to a much slower economic uh, uh, trend. Uh, and uh, the possible example is Italy, of course, but but others as well. Um, and, uh, and the other is uh, that the other pro-support uh, argument is that this support is going to come against the economic reform. If that is indeed going to happen in, in the European economies towards more competitiveness, I would definitely uh, be more amenable to this, uh, this one. But whether the, uh, the European Commission is going to be able to enforce uh, its principle, it's, it's, it's to be seen. So this is my first question about this. Isn't it elementarily pro-cyclical, over uh, threatening in a very major way, over uh, uh, heating the economies, both in the United, particularly in the United States, but also in Europe? Because of course, beyond that, those four trillions that the US is, uh, has already spent or has already pledged, spent and pledged, uh, here is two trillion, tomorrow is another two trillion uh, 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 sounding from the president's mouth. So, uh, so it's really, uh, we are talking about really giant numbers. And then um, the, the other is more structural. Uh, and that is really ab about the long term. It, it seems to me that since uh, Greenspan was not able to, to deal with this uh, uh, irrational exuberance in the American economy, and it was in '94 uh, when I heard it. I was living there, and I took took uh, the chairman seriously. But ever since, uh, it uh, there was no courage to really uh, burst these irrational expectations. And it seems to me that more and more we are taking out risk from the economy and. Uh, it seems to me that the economy cannot only be nationalized by, by physically nationalizing companies, but, but also another way is to simply take out the risk uh, from, from the economy. And uh, this, this always first reaction to, to put more money in it. And again, I don't dispute 2020, but uh, I need to be convinced that uh, down the road in 2022 and 2122, and the economic growth is going to be really galloping, we, we need further fiscal and, and monetary stimulus of central banks whose balance sheet, as uh, uh, Professor Shurani knows infinitely better than me, uh, whose balance sheet has already been ballooned beyond any any imagination uh, 15, 20 years ago. So that would be, and that is really a component, just one more sentence with, uh, with this new modern monetary theory in the, in the United States that really, if it's taken seriously, it will spell 
uh, even more trouble in macroeconomic terms. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Mijai. Uh, I would immediately add another question that I received at the same time, which it can be linked to this. Mr. Mijai was talking about eventually taking out the risk uh, from uh, the economy, but there is another question, whether now uh, the use of this modern monetary salary and the quantitative easing and the helicopter money, it does not mean that the uh, central banks can lose control or the governments can lose control over the economy. I would pass the floor uh, now to uh, uh, Professor Shurani first. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, I try to be uh, uh, very focused because the, the issues raised by Kaman and you are really very broad and uh, one could, uh, could elaborate uh, lengthy on it, but I will not do that, so I'm not threatening. So the, as far as the, uh, what an extent, uh, if I reformulate what Kaman uh, asked, what an extent uh, further uh, stimulus uh, can be justified. Uh, I do agree with Carmen that, uh, especially in the United States, there are, there are signs of overheating. Once there is an economy which is growing at an annualized uh, rate of 6.6% on the one hand, creating uh, an enormous number of new jobs was extremely successful in bringing down the fast jumping unemployment from 14.6% 14 to somewhat lower than 6% in less than a year, uh, one really has to think about the appropriateness of further stimulus. I would say that uh, as far as uh, I'm a bit, uh, uh, how to say, I do see some contradiction in my argument because uh, I would not, uh, I would be uh, in favor for the second and third package put together by the Biden administration. So as far as the uh, investment related uh, project, infrastructure development, uh, research and development support um, and so forth. So as far as uh, digital, digitalization uh, is concerned. I believe it is absolutely needed uh, and justified. As far as the more social related issues, which is aiming to cover the, the kids and, and the families, they are also, at least to my mind, to my values are justified since the United States is still lagging behind in providing social safety net uh, to a wide uh, range of the society. So I think these are uh, justified. Nonetheless, uh, neither the Trump nor the Biden first and Biden first and uh, Trump first and second and Trump first package uh, seems to me uh, well uh, orchestrated. The reason is the following. Uh, I believe it's been uh, far too generous, far too procyclical, and uh, even socially uh, quite uh, not that much justified. Uh, to be precise and brief, I mentioned already that the uh, weekly uh, payment over the unemployment benefit uh, seemed to me seemed to me. Uh, unnecessarily too generous. The $600 per week uh, was roughly twice as big as it should have been. Second, the helicopter money with which I, uh, in general, I would agree, uh, it's been also far too generous. Uh, each and every American citizen, if I understand it well, uh, making less than $75,000 per annum received the $2,000 check and it's been repeated uh, in, in these days. I think it is far too generous in case of a person who is making 75,000, which is roughly almost twice as high as the median income in the United States. Uh, it's uh, unnecessarily uh, too uh, generous. 
and it is going to undermine the financial stability over the long horizon, not right now, but on the long horizon. So I would say uh, here we are uh, talk and it's, it's been repeated in case of the Biden administration uh, in a period when the American economy is already back to less than 6% unemployment on the one hand, on the other hand, uh, the economy is booming already. So I do agree that these are excess, excesses and uh, these are uh, creating issues. Uh, also, I, I agree uh, implicitly, uh, uh, Mr. Mijai said that uh, uh, it, seems to, it seems to be as if the risk would be taken out of the, of the economies. Uh, it is uh, especially true uh, in case of Europe. Uh, this Kurzarbeit uh, type approach is clearly, uh, first of all, uh, uh, in my mind, it is, uh, uh, it is uh, going against the structural changes. It is paralyzing the current structure of the economy it is offering uh, subsidies uh, primarily not even to the employees, but to the employers in order to be able to keep uh, the people at, the, at, the, at their current job. No one knows what is going to be the, the future structure of the economy. No one knows uh, how deep uh, the structural adjustment is going to be. No one knows uh, which jobs can, can survive of this pandemic. Therefore, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, job keeping uh, subsidy, in my mind, goes against the stability of the economy. And uh, Kama, you are right, uh, in an economy, well, in a market economy, uh, which is based on competition, we believe that the, in, that the entrepreneurs, investors, owners are investing their money. They are uh, investing and when they do their decisions, they are undertaking risks. Uh, therefore, we can accept that as the, since they are risking their own uh, life, own uh, savings, own money, own capital, they deserve uh, profit on it. But if we move to a direction when the, when the uh, uh, gains, the profits are privatized and the losses are uh, going to be uh, public, then it's a very, uh, uh, very bad direction. So uh, it is the nature of a market economy that uh, investors, entrepreneurs, uh, owners, uh, are gaining and losing. And if, uh, if this uh, process is going to be one-sided, it's going to undermine the, the long-term uh, stability, the long-term competitiveness uh, of the market economy. So I, I, I agree with that. Uh, as far as the modern monetary theory is concerned, uh, if, I, uh, if I'm going to be brutal, I would say it is neither modern nor monetary nor theory. Uh, in its uh, most simplistic uh, framework, uh, it is uh, completely uh, uh, invalid. Uh, nevertheless, uh, I, would, uh, I would say that uh, there is something in it. If we uh, assume that an economy, uh, I mean, on the one hand, uh, I have a sympathy with, with the MMT because it is uh, going straight against a, a very serious and bad orthodoxy of our, uh, of our profession. Namely, uh, once the, the uh, once we have suffered in the economic history seriously from the hyperinflation, and the hyperinflation uh, primarily happened throughout uh, as a consequence of, of uh, wars, uh, we have come to the conclusion that uh, the direct, direct central bank financing, namely the monetization of public deficit, uh, should be prohibited. 
uh, I think the issue is uncomparable, more complex. If we assume very briefly, if we assume an economy which is, uh, go, which is uh, about to grow 3% annually in real terms, and which is about to produce 2% inflation annually, it means that the economy is, grow, is uh, growing nominally 5% per annum. If the economy is growing 5%, and if this 5% growth is sustainable, namely, it is, uh, it is uh, uh, I mean, the external balances uh, are also sustainable. Uh, the, uh, un the employment is close to full employment. Uh, if the, the, the financial indicators are okay, if the inflation expectation, inflationary expectations are anchored around price stability, then if it is growing 5%, it means uh, on the long run that the, uh, that the economy is required 5% annual uh, growth in the money supply. If the money supply is about to grow 5% annually, it also uh, demands a certain amount of, broad of, uh, of fiat money growth, of central bank money increase. And, uh, in a, and if we simplify, uh, if we make a simplistic assessment, it means that uh, a sustainable economic growth is required uh, is required a sustainable annual increase of central bank mo money creation. In my mind, it doesn't matter whether that uh, increased uh, required increased central bank money is directly uh, put into the hands of the government if it is directly uh, financing the fiscal deficit, or if this money is getting into circulation throughout the banking system and the banking system uh, pumps that money to the hands of the government. So uh, in my mind, uh, the, the monetization of the central bank uh, of, the, of the fiscal sector deficit is not a crime provided if the monetization is in line, ex ante is in line with the, uh, with the nominal growth of the economy, including the price stability, including the external stability, including the stability of the macro, macro level savings investment balance. Now, uh, if we now if we uh, if we analyze the advice provided by the uh, supporters of the MMT when they are completely neglecting the external, the sustainability of the external position, when they are completely neglecting uh, the, uh, its impact on the inflation if it is going to be excessive, uh, when they are completely neglecting the uh, available uh, uh, resources in, sense of, in the sense of uh, uh, labor supply on the one hand and uh, competitive uh, uh, capital type capacities. Uh, so when they are neglecting this and when they are uh, emphasizing that the, the government can spend as much as they want, uh, the government, there is no limit in government uh, created, in, in the government created demand. It's not going to create anything wrong that is crazy. If the world, uh, if the, if the uh, issues all over the world, if the, the uh, then uh, if, if, uh, if the solution would be so easy just to print money, just to monetize the public deficit, then there would be no low income country all over the world because uh, I mean, to create money, it's uh, really very easy. So, if the uh, conditions, if the framework under which the monetization of the uh, budget deficit can be uh, accepted, if those conditions are uh, seriously uh, decided, seriously determined, uh, then uh, the monetization of the, of the fiscal deficit is not a crime. Otherwise, if anyone dares to say that there is no limit 
for government spending. There is no limit for the government generated demand. Uh, I think it is completely irresponsible. Thank you very much, Professor Shurani. Indeed, this is a topic um, about which one could one could uh, discuss uh, long, long, long time. But thank you very much uh, for your very comprehensive uh, answer. Now I have another question, and this one uh, I would like to uh, to uh, to put to Professor Kendry, and that uh, is a question concerning um, this huge. Uh, uh, amount of uh, money pumped into the wealth, uh, into the, uh, the developed countries' economy. And the question is whether this will lead the world to a new type of wealth redistribution that will lead to deepen the gap between the poor and the rich countries. What is your opinion about this? Because poor countries cannot use this tool. Well, thank you very much, um, Jolt, for that very important question. Uh, I might hasten to add that listening to Professor Shurani's very comprehensive um, explanation to a question he received about modern monetary theory, it made me uh, look quickly for my book, The Dis Defic Deficit uh, Myth, which is indeed the book that has been widely quoted in the United States and elsewhere by Professor Stephanie Kelton. And Professor Shurani has given a very um, good account of the strengths and weaknesses of that approach. But to go back to this important question about the widening of um, inequality uh, based upon the pumping of money into the advanced economies, of course, as we know from previous um, quantitative easing and um, measures adopted during the post-2009 uh, recession, um, it's going to depend very much on what happens to asset prices and what happens to exchange rates in terms of how uh, the emerging economies or the less advanced economies will experience the impact of these large amounts of uh, uh, sums in the form of helicopter money or in the form of uh, quantitative easing enter into uh, the um, economies of um, the advanced countries. My main concern here is that uh, I honestly believe that we need to pay far more attention to the, um, the widening gap, the inequality gap in terms of, uh, not just in terms of the um, economic uh, widening gap, uh, uh, we know that um, China will, as we have heard in the presentation, uh, provided in such a, a, an expert authoritative way, we know that China will, within about seven years, um, probably overtake the uh, United States in terms of its uh, annual output uh, in aggregate, its gross domestic output or product. But that given the, uh, given the per capita uh, issue, then China will remain behind the United States for uh, quite some time. And the rate of uh, technological progress and innovation taking place in the United States and uh, really potentially in Europe um, is going to mean that the kind of concerns that Professor Shurani has expressed about um, the ways in which uh, maybe there is just too much money being pumped in at this point um, are going to uh, resurface again. What's going to happen in terms of the uh, unequal economy, the economies that are struggling to gain um, a foothold after the pandemic and exactly how they are going to be able to uh, progress after the pandemic um, is, is unclear. It's one of the uncertainties that we are um, facing because we do not know how vulnerable the uh, emerging economies are going to be um, in the absence of further uh, direct um, financial innovation, financial support into, for example, um, improving public health systems, public health investment, 
uh, in terms of trying to introduce measures of trying to secure uh, emerging economies from the ravages which have been imposed by this particular pandemic. So I think that my, um, my answer to the question is fundamentally is that we are experiencing a widening of inequality, uh, of opportunity, an inequality not just in terms of livelihoods, but in terms of uh, how public health systems can be strengthened and supported. And I fear that if we do not uh, really seriously address this kind of inequality and its, um, and its escalation, then we will face serious problems in insecurity um, in, in the coming years. And it won't surprise you because you know that I was indeed the NATO senior defense economist. So the secretary general always wanted to know what were likely to be the consequences for stability and security arising from the various economic um, events taking place. So I think my concern about the um, money being entered into the advanced economies is to what extent there will be mechanisms and channels to support the uh, a kind of a Marshall Plan type two um, reach out to the whole of the global economy, particularly to those societies that are struggling and will struggle even further in the years to come. Thank you very much, Professor Kendry. We are almost at the end of our meeting, but still we have uh, uh, one person, Professor Matush, who would like to take the floor for, uh, for a few minutes. So I pass the floor to him and then uh, we will close, unfortunately, this very interesting uh, session. Um, Professor Matush, the floor is yours. Uh, your microphone doesn't work. Okay. Does it work now? Yes, it is good now. Sorry. Uh, I would like to react to the first question regarding the uh, future of globalization. Uh, I totally agree with Mr. Shulani, who said that it probably will be slowed down. It cannot be uh, uh, stopped. It cannot be reversed. It cannot continue like it uh, was in effect uh, until now. So it probably will slow down. The big question is that uh, how this new phase of globalization will impact the, the very important question of growing inequality uh, regarding uh, property and, and income. And uh, the growing in, in inequality, how it will impact the domestic political situations in different countries. So what happened in the United States uh, uh, in uh, 2016, uh, I, I would say that it can be uh, somehow related to the, uh, uh, this growing impact regarding the American society. The poorest 50% of the American population, uh, their income, uh, did not uh, uh, develop, uh, it stagnated, maybe a little bit was were, were increased. And uh, the big question is how this situation impacted uh, the result of the 1916, uh, uh, 2016 elections. The populism, which was uh, uh, presented by uh, President Trump uh, probably can be connected to this uh, uh, situation in the United States. Uh, since COVID-19 added a new security concern, global security concern to the already existing climate change, unemployment, uh, 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 increasing competition for vital resources, uh, the big question is how it will impact the readiness of states to cooperate. Uh, how the geopolitical competition for uh, uh, resources uh, will increase the 
readiness and ability of states to cooperate in the international economy. And uh, so these are very interesting questions which uh, should be answered in the near future. In Davos, uh, years before the COVID-19, a very interesting debate started about the changing of fundamental rules of capitalism. Instead of uh, shareholder capitalism, uh, probably it would be more just socially to have a stakeholder capitalism, uh, which means that uh, big firms, big co corporations uh, should be encouraged to take more social responsibilities. Uh, they should spend more money to solve the uh, very uh, vital issues of uh, social injustices, environment, uh, and so on, and so on. So I would suggest that uh, we should pay attention to this uh, uh, debates on fundamental economic and social issues as well. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Matus. Just I would like to ask if... Um, our, uh, our, our two speakers, if you have any uh, further comment that you would like to add, uh, Professor Shurani first, do you want to tell a few words uh, more? Really very few. Uh, regarding the, the money pumped into the system, what makes me a little bit uh, feared is the fact that uh, contrary to the 208, 209, uh, uh, crisis when the uh, central bank monetary creation has not increased the broad money. The broad money, in spite of uh, uh, the central bank balance sheet, grew three times as compared to the pre-crisis pre period. The broad money has not uh, increased uh, excessively. The monetary growth, the broad money growth was not more than 2-3% annually, so it's been completely in line with the, with the price stability. Uh, right now, on the contrary, the central bank balance sheet, the Fed balance sheet uh, doubled, uh, but the broad money increased more than 20% over the course of the last year. And even if I'm not a monetarist, uh, I do believe that uh, over the longer period, this uh, significant liquidity created by the central bank or, or initiated by the central bank because the money is created by the commercial banking sector, uh, sooner or later will be spent. Therefore, uh, I think it is a real issue how long this uh, monetary stimulus uh, can, uh, can be maintained. And this is one of the reasons why the modern monetary theory, if it is not uh, 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 surrounded by real conditionalities, are going to be dangerous. Thank you very much. Professor Kendry, do you want to say a few more words? Yes, I'd like to respond to the important points made by Professor Mateusz. I agree, Professor Mateusz, with almost everything that you said. I think that you uh, pointed out the future of globalization um, and its slowdown will nevertheless probably be accompanied by growing inequalities in um, property and property values and income. And you concluded by saying that if we look at the 2016 election in which Trump became president, uh, albeit uh, not really decisively, but that was to do with the US electoral system, the uh, consequent, the, the, one of the dimensions of this is the way in which people who uh, voted felt that they had lost out in the period uh, after the 28, 29 um, uh, big problems within the US about its uh, um, sub debt, uh, the mortgage subprime um, crisis. And I think that, that your point that you make here is really vital because it demonstrates that these inequalities that I was referring to, uh, they're not simply inequalities in terms of 
uh, cross country inequalities across the world. They're inequalities within countries and they pose dangerous problems for all of us in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Kendry. I would like to, unfortunately, we have no more time. Really, we are running uh, far behind the, the scheduled time. I would like to thank you uh, to, uh, to uh, our two distinguished guests for sharing with us their thoughts. And I would like to thank also to our participants for their interest and also the active participation. Now, before we leave, I would like to draw your attention to the next story behind webinar in June, which will focus on the new US uh, foreign policy. So follow us, the ICDT on Instagram, Twitter on fa or Facebook. Visit the ICDT website, which is, uh, which is icdtfoundation.com for receiving a timely information about our next programs. Thank you very much for everybody and see you next time. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.